Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Support for the Mep Faber Show and the following message come from Wonder Capital, allowing individuals to invest in solar projects. Earn up to 8.5% annually while diversifying your portfolio and combating global climate change. Create an account for free at wondercapital.com forward slash Meb. Do well and do good. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Today we have a special guest here all the way from Taipei. Jason Zhu, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. For those who aren't familiar with Jason, quick background, founder, chairman, CIO of Radiant Global Advisors, which is a little bit of a spin-off and new company that Jason started, but some of those may be familiar with him in a, in a previous life as one of the co-founders and, and vice chairman of Research Affiliates. Uh, if you guys recall, we had um, one of his partners, Rob Arnott, on an earlier podcast. Jason has also been a professor, as well as publishing like 10,000 academic papers and being on a bunch of boards and all that editors and good stuff for a bunch of academic papers. But one of my favorite things about Jason is he's got one foot in the practitioner world as well as one foot in the academic world. So, Jason, just let, let's start with a super quick background. Maybe just give our listeners a, a, a quick overview uh, of kind of how you got to starting Raylant. You know, I, it looks like you've gone to almost every university in the state of California for, for <laughs> one degree or another, but uh, why, don't, why don't we start there? Absolutely. Matt, you, you explained to everyone already that Raylian Global Advisor is uh, a spin-off from uh, a firm that uh, others are perhaps more familiar with, which is a research affiliate, a firm that uh, Rob Arnott and I started, uh, wow, now it's almost 16 years ago. At the start of last year, Rob and I spoke, and uh, we decided to uh, spin off uh, Raylian Global Advisors, which was uh, previously Research Affiliates Asia, as its own independent separate entity that allows me to have a vehicle to really double down on a big bully, big passion of mine, which is the emergence of uh, China and, uh, and the necessity for investors to, uh, to have exposure to that economy as a portion of their overall portfolio. So I'm hoping uh, with Radiant Global Advisors to be the very best uh, provider of Asian equities to investors, you know, global institutional investors, to uh, retail investors, all the same. You know, so I was actually I was going to talk about China a little bit later, but but let's talk about it now. Now that now that we're on the topic of Asia, both developed and emerging as well. One of our other recent guests was super excited about the opportunities he sees in China in the given years. Part of it being just sort of current macro backdrop based on lower valuations, as well as. One of his biggest thesis, and I wanted to ask you about it, is there's a lot of interest in Chinese stocks, and particularly as they're getting added to the global indices. And he saw this as kind of a, a sea change that the, the, the marketplace really hasn't appreciated or factored in at this point. Is, is that something you agree with, disagree with? What, and, and what's your general just kind of overview of, you know, kind of boots on the ground? What's your, what's your perspective on, uh, on, on this whole area? I, I wholeheartedly agree with that, with that thesis. In fact, uh, there are really sort of two hypotheses, and I think they're no longer hypotheses. These are, these are uh, beliefs that I have. One is as China uh, begins to, um, to make its ascent to become the world's largest economy by GDP, and as its uh, equity market and fixed income market get close to the size of the U.S., uh, investors are going to discover they're under uh, exposed 
Uh, in fact, I guess you could say they're under diversified in the sense that they don't have enough China exposure within their portfolio, be it on uh, the duration side, be it on the uh, on the equity side. And there's going to be a meaningful rebalance coming out of that realization. Now, we're already hearing a lot of talk about MSCI, including China, into uh, its EM index, and I'm sure later on into the, uh, the, the all-world index. Of course, FTSE's already done so two years back in a custom index for Vanguard. So there's, there's already uh, awareness from the very biggest players about increasing exposure to China. So that's one part, and that's really what I would say the beta story. Right? It is a diversifying beta. It is a meaningful beta if you want to participate in global growth. The other part is, of course, the alpha component. The interesting thing about China is anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of the daily trade flow comes from retail investors. And this is literally people who have very little financial education, uh, who exhibit all the behavioral anomalies that, that the MEB you documented in, in books and articles you've written. Uh, and so we're talking about 85 percent on average of all trades are conducted by those individuals. And that means the probability for uh, alpha for managers is just so much larger in that market versus, say, in the U.S., where 85% of all trades are done by you know hedge funds, robots, uh, high-frequency guys, and, and the pros. So anyone who's seeking to, to find alpha, I think that's got to be a market you spend some time fishing. And, and we'll link to all your papers on the show notes, but one paper that I wasn't even going to talk about today, but, but now that we're on the topic, I remember you were writing about uh, kind of the mid 2000s bubble, and I think it was mid 2000s bubble in China, and comparing it to some other bubbles and valuations, and it's it's so funny to look at from someone like myself who's a quant and and kind of distance from this, but now that China, in many ways, is at much 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 lower valuations, almost nobody is interested anymore. Yeah, um, is 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 that a similar perspective? Uh, you know, from from that side of the globe, or have you may, maybe talk a little bit about that paper and kind of educate the listeners what uh, what I'm talking about. Sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, a, a spectacular uh, run up and collapse uh, in the China stock market occurred around, I would say, the latter half of 2015. That's the, the run up phase, and then uh, uh, that bursted uh, fairly quickly uh, in the first half of 2016. And we're talking about a run up of you know 180 percent. Followed by a collapse uh, that was, uh, you know, that destroyed about 65% of market value. So, a fairly large bubble that occurred over a very short period of time. Uh, and I think what most people remembered from it was all of the interesting policy, short term policy interventions that were, that were put into place that caused a lot of people to, uh, to you know, lose some confidence in that market or in the uh, regulators for that market. So that was, that's kind of the backdrop uh, of the entire event. But I think, Meb, the point that you, uh, you made was during the run-up, everyone was big on China. They thought of um, the run-up in the stock market as a, a validation from the investors of the ascension of China into uh, a, a major global player. There's a lot of excitement about uh, China reaching out to the rest of Southeast Asia in terms of what they call the one built, one road uh, economic policy. And of course, just as soon as uh, the bubble collapsed, Everyone stopped talking about that, and the sentiment became very, very negative, and it was all about the uh, incompetence of the policymaker and the fact that uh, you know China is never really going to become a true global player. And all at the same time, if you look at the underlying shift in fundamental, there is you know some volatility, but nothing out of normal. And, uh, and it just goes to show the amount of retail sentiment that could turn on a dime. That's driving the market volatility. And it's not just true inside China. I think there are a lot of uh, global flows that were just as fragile in terms of its positive and, uh, and negative sentiment flows. And I think this, again, remind us of you know, the kind of behavioral swings that can occur that's uncorrelated with really the underlying uh, fundamental volatility that we see in so many different markets. Right? We saw that during uh, the tech bubble. We saw that again during the, uh, this, the real estate and credit bubble in the U.S., I think this is just yet another reminder uh, about the uh, the volatility in investment psychology uh, exhibited by 
we tell predominantly, but also sometimes institutional investors. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, the as institutions and professional investors, we often, you know, can look down on the retail and say, you guys are so crazy, but you've actually written quite a bit of research. And this is probably a good segue in general to talking about humans just being humans and doing really dumb things over and over and investing. We have a, a paper in front of me um, called Timing Poorly, a guide to generating poor returns while investing in successful strategies. And you have a bunch of papers and thoughts on kind of this whole concept of why are so people so bad at <laughs> implementing simple ideas that they're already on board with in many cases or simple concept? Why are people so bad at investing? Yeah, as a graduate student, uh, the one thing that, uh, that that we all had to buy into was that you know, the market's pretty efficient. And why is the market pretty efficient? Well, because you know this is serious business. Lots of lots of uh, money at play. Uh, big institutions, big money. But when we look more and more at the data, what we discover is uh, this just ain't so. For example, you know, one of the uh, uh, you know greatest questions that I think. Whenever I run into Bill Sharp, that he asks uh, about you know, smart data and and about uh, factor investing is, well, if these strategies are so reliable and make so much sense, why doesn't everyone do it? And if everyone's doing it, how can it keep working? Right? Essentially, it's, it's asking, who's the dumb dumb on the other side of your trade? And that just take uh, value strategy. And I'm a big believer. I think Meb, you're a big believer that a sensible buy low, sell high, discipline value strategy could create excess return for investors in the long run. Seems fairly straightforward. A lot of people buy into it. We certainly hear Warren Buffett promoting the virtue of value investing constantly when he speaks. So why doesn't everyone do it? And maybe everyone is doing it. And if that's the case, how can we believe that there's still any excess return left from that strategy? So I decided to explore that in the paper that you mentioned uh, to look at, hey, let's study these very successful strategies that's been documented uh, in, in academic literature and see just how much alpha how we squeezed out of that lemon and whether there's any more juice left over. And the big surprise that I saw was when you look at how investors who invest in value strategies, and I generally want to you know, argue that the value investors are probably more financially savvy. They're the ones who uh, you know, perhaps gone to B school and remembered uh, that the value factor outperformed. And, uh, and even try to uh, be disciplined in, 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 in buying value products. But the way in which they buy value looks like the following. That is, they bought into value, and then during the late 90s, as they saw the growth outperformance against value, they quickly lose confidence. And by the, the, the end of 1999, they have completely given up, believe that uh, what they learned from, from the textbook was wrong, switched over to being large-cap growth investor. Uh, only to be hit by the collapse of the tech bubble. Uh, they got back into the market in a big way again in, say, 2004 and five after a major value rally and where all the value funds are uh, rated Morningstar, five stars, with their wonderful past three, five years track record. Again, massive flows into value funds, only again to run head straight into the global financial crisis where uh, because bank shares are generally uh, value uh, stocks. Uh, lost a lot of money, and then you saw a lot of outflow in, uh, say, beginning of 2009, only again to miss the massive value rebound in the following year and a half. This is actually what we see in data, that is flow chase short-term performance, and as a result of that, no one's really a buy-and-hold investor as we uh, sort of measure what, uh, what investors are doing. They're timing funds or timing managers, unfortunately, the way they time is quite counterproductive. That is, they, they get into funds that's done well recently, uh, into managers that done, done well recently, and simply uh, get hit and smack on the head as a buy in at the peak of a style cycle uh, or an asset clock cycle. And that's what I see. We see exactly that for value investors. And so when you tabulate uh, the excess dollar alpha they should have earned, it's actually quite negative. 
You know, it's funny. Then there's a lot of people you've mentioned in your articles. Russ Kennel um, is a great one, and, and a number of others that talk about this gap and behaving poorly. I, and I can't remember one of your papers I read. Some of your advice was simply, "Hey, forget your password to your investment account and just and just let it sit dormant," which is ironically probably a great advice. But 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 what? How do people combat this? Like it, it's so hard not to want to you know, trade or update or, or but look, what's your, what's your best advice? Like, what do you tell your grad students? What do you tell people that, you know, these huge institutions you're talking to in, in Asia and everywhere else you say, look, here's the sound investment plan. You know, how do you, how do you, what, what's your advice there? Yeah. Uh, my best advice to most of my students uh, is whatever you think is a good idea, whatever you observe yourself doing or your classmates doing, just stop. Stop doing that. Do the opposite, and you're going to be more successful. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you look at data, uh, the average investor is not very successful, right? I think all the data points to if you're a average individual trader, you're a six and a half percent behind a passive index. Uh, if you buy active funds and you know pick and choose, you're two and a half percent behind just buying an equal weighted. Uh, blend a uh, passive fund. So there are all these data that says whatever it is that you think you're doing that's adding value is actually just detracting value. So just do the opposite. Uh, and so it just goes to show that uh, this is a market where the average human tendencies are precisely the wrong thing to do. And you have to recognize that. Recognize that you, I, most of us are probably average. And we, we got to recognize, acknowledge that and then, first of all, stop ourselves, because if we don't stop ourselves, we'll just get the average outcome, because we're not that special. And uh, as best as possible, uh, perhaps try to do the opposite. And I think the opposite often is don't check your stock quotes uh, every 30 seconds. Uh, don't trade when you feel like you want to trade, because most likely you're gambling rather than acting on good information. Whatever information you think might be private, proprietary, and valuable, it's probably common knowledge and perhaps even stale. Uh, so if you can just argue the opposite of what you believe, you're going to do much better. Well, you know, it's funny. I, you know, one of these days, a study I've always wanted to run, and maybe we'll we'll get uh, a bunch of your UCLA grad students to do this. And by, by the way, I was just down at the uh, UCLA Fink conference um, this this past week. Cool. Um, but but one of the ideas was to I said. I'm pretty sure how this works out, but I would love to to do this study. I'll fund it. So if there's any professors listening to you guys, reach out. Let me know. I would love to go get all the copies of the Wall Street Journal or you know Barron's going back to 1900. Pick out probably the 50 or 100 biggest global you know headline events and say, look, we're going to give this to the investor. You know, this date, this is Pearl Harbor got bombed. Boom. That's the that's your what do you predict the future one week, one month, one year stock returns are? And, you know, my guess, and you, I think you would probably agree with me, would be that even if given tomorrow's headlines today, it wouldn't make any difference to investor and outcomes. And, and, and so what people spend so much time thinking about, of course, is you know, watching CNBCs, the headlines, and what's going on with Russia and FBI, and uh, you know all this stuff. I'm of the opinion it doesn't matter much. So, if anyone wants to run that study, reach out, let me know, and uh, I, I'd love to do it. But I don't, I don't want to personally sit in uh, the, <laughs> the bottom of the LA Times fishing out papers for for a long weekend. You know, part of the part of the thing behind this is probably along the lines one of the reasons why it, and you know, our industry is guilty of it as well, is you talk about in, in one of your papers and in pieces called the confounding bias for investment complexity. And so maybe talk a little bit about that as, as your thoughts there. This, this article was really inspired by Daniel Kahneman's uh, best-selling book. And it's a fantastic book that I, I, I suggest everyone go, go take a look. This is uh, Think Fast, Think Slow. And so basically what it says is that the human brain is very, very good at rationalizing. Uh, we make decisions that are actually fairly instinctual, mostly driven by emotions. And then the, uh, the rational part of our brain simply gives a good excuse to make us think we're just making a really good sound decision based on data, when in fact it's all purely driven by emotions. At least, you know, by and large, most of our decisions are that way. 
And so as it turns out, when you look at financial products, you know, our industry is, is known for selling a lot of complexity because, hey, if you want someone to pay you, uh, if your strategy is really simple, so simple that the investor himself could replicate it if he had access to Yahoo Finance and Excel spreadsheet, it's unlikely you're going to get paid. So totally understand uh, that, that the industry profit maximization strategy is to you know, sell things that are complex, that people would be afraid of trying it at home. Now, the problem with that is that the complexity costs the investor to develop following belief, which is they are investing in an expert who's doing something that's very complex that the investor himself doesn't understand, and therefore he has to trust. Uh, and then he'll reward that trust when he sees good performance. Now, the problem, of course, we know is in the short run, performance completely random. What that means is there's about a 50-50 chance that come next two years, the investor will be disappointed. And instead of saying, that's just random noise, or I made that decision, they'll say, I trusted you uh, to do this right. And now I am going to stop trusting you. And in fact, I'm going to fix this problem. I'm going to punish you for violating my trust. And that almost is, 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 is the script for our business, for how products are sold and how investors and, 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 and managers uh, interact. Is there's a cycle of, oh, I'm going to trust you to do something I don't understand. And then I'm going to get disappointed. I'm going to fire you and feel vindicated that uh, I have punished you for violating my trust. Now, the result of this cycle is that people buy things they don't understand. Managers promise, perhaps, short-term performance that's not possible. And people get dis disappointed, uh, funds are fired, and no one can really actually be a long-term investor and see a strategy or see a manager through a proper market cycle. So this complexity actually creates this really bad dynamics in our industry where the investors return on a dollar-weighted perspective is far worse than the manager's printed results if you were only able to buy and hold that manager for a full market cycle. So that's the issue with complexity in our market. It's what helps with fees, helps with selling. In the long run, it's actually been bad for everyone. You know, simplicity on the other end, um, and then, you know, we can really kind of point to the Vanguard and iShares type index investors. They tend to exhibit a lot less of that because what they're buying is something that's fairly transparent. It is not at all complex. So the psychologist goes, hey, I don't trust the manager. I trust myself. So I'm going to buy something and own that decision. And people are far more forgiving with that because what happens is um, when the market goes down, they say, hey, I think the market's going to come back up. Being a solid long-term investor in the U.S. market is a good idea. So I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore short-term fluctuation. And uh, the result of that is uh, you see index investors tend to be able to buy and hold and at least and participate in the long run uh, in uh, in the equity premium. There was a study that we talk a lot about where you know, the name of the blog post we did was, was called something along the lines of institutional investors are delusional, where it was a survey. And in the survey, they asked these institutional investors, how long would you give a um, active or smart beta manager um, underperforming before you would seek his replacement and 89 to 99 percent said two years <laughs> and so you and i both know and so listeners like we, we laugh because one of the best probably time frames for mean reversion is that sort of two to five year period meaning you want the worst performers over the last two three four years and so exactly what they're doing is the opposite of what you should be doing. So simple advice of rebalancing, you know, research affiliates has talked about the concept of over rebalancing, meaning, you know, you're going to tilt even more to what's done very poorly over the last few years are, are, are very sensible things. One, one of the things I liked in um, example used in this, in this paper is you talked about fishing lures and, and, you know, fishing for tuna where, you know, in many cases, these very simple lures do just as good of a job. And <laughs> I wanted to make a comment because uh, I was reading that, and I'm going to murder his name, Vaughn Chenard, the, the founder of Patagonia, older guy, but, but one of the really pioneers in climbing and a true outdoorsman. He just um, published an article and was talking about it where he's been fly fishing all over the world for his whole life and said he went. I think it was over a year experiment where he just used one fly 
And it wasn't even in, it was in different conditions. So it was in the ocean, it was in rivers, it was in lakes. And the only thing he changed was the size. And he says, I've had just as much success with this. I think it was a pheasant tail partridge as I've had with these, you know, every local angler and these tens of thousands of flies I've used. I thought that was a really interesting example, um, just about the complexity and, and simplicity as well. I, I, I probably couldn't possibly do a podcast without at least touching on smart beta and factor investing. It's something that you um, and your team have been pioneers on and have talked about over the years. Um, and you have some pretty interesting opinions on it too. Uh, Research Affiliates had, had published uh, some pretty cool new interactive software that um, talks about expected returns and valuations of factors. And, and you've written particularly on, um, I think I guess how you give you a speech on this, on trading costs and implementing smart beta factors. I, we don't have a whole lot of time, but why don't you give us an overview on kind of the main takeaways that you think are important for an investor that, that is considering or already implement smart beta sort of strategies? Absolutely. Uh, I think the emerging consensus around smart beta is uh, the technology behind it, you know, the, the finance theory behind it is things that, that, that we know for 30, 40 years, uh, goes back to the 1970s for many of the factors that are now being uh, being baked into smart beta product. So the technology, the theory, uh, they're all tried and true. What's different is now putting it into a index or index-like uh, chassis so that low-cost product could be produced. So it's really an innovation uh, in terms of lower cost, greater transparency in the in the product. Uh, and so, you know, the way you want to think about this is uh, figure out what are the the factors or the anomalies. Because most of these factors, uh, really, when you think about them, uh, the literature uh, understands them to be sort of behavioral anomalies, just systematic ways of capturing mistakes that the average investor uh, make. So think of capturing these anomalies uh, that are academically robust, been vetted by, uh, by you know, different generations of scholars, and there's an underlying economic motivation as to why they'll continue to work, because oftentimes these behavioral bias are so ingrained, you know, it's part of how we evolve as a species, that, uh, that it's unlikely to change over, uh, over you know, any intermediate horizon. So you got to make sure that that, that that theory and empirical data and support is there. And then, you know, it's, it's not too complicated from that point on invest in a diversified handful of um, you know, factors or call it anomalies, if that's the language you prefer, uh, and invest in them in as low cost of fashion as possible. So that's likely going to be uh, ETF type vehicles that access these uh, behavioral anomalies. And then forget your password or, or, or you know, tie your hand anytime you, you think about uh, picking up your, your mobile app and trade. Uh, just don't do that. Be a buy and hold investor over a proper market cycle or two, and you're likely to see uh, better outperformance than uh, doing uh, something much more expensive, much more active. Uh, and so that, that, I think, is how I would summarize smart beta from kind of a theory and product perspective, and also in terms of my advice in how investors ought to go, go forth and execute on this. Do you have a favorite of the thousands of factors you've looked at? What's 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 kind of Jason? What what, what does your psyche sort of gravitate to? Are you a are you a momentum guy? Are you a quality guy? Are you value? What's what's uh what's your personal belief there? So I'm pretty traditional. So I'm boring in this case. So I really like value, and uh, and that's been around for a very long time. Right? This goes all the way back to Graham and Dot, and that's that's from uh, you know the 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 twenties. Uh, but it's it's really tried and true, and I've done a lot of research that convinced me that yes, whatever is driving the value anomaly, driving the value premium, uh, the mistakes that uh, that people make that uh, creates a value premium that continues to be made by uh, by individual investors, by institutional investors, the like. Uh, so I'm I'm a big believer in that, and really um, the the stories an easy one to tell you know for whatever reason people prefer to pay for growth growth is more exciting growth is sexier uh, growth in the short run 
um, you know, can be successful. And uh, and that momentum is uh, is going to uh, to to you know lure us into um, uh, uh, into into chasing it. So, you know, these behaviors uh, are, are persistent, and uh, if you can be patient, being on the other side is going to give you success. You know, it, it, it's interesting. We, we, we often, the example we often give is Warren Buffett, and we say, look, you know, Warren Buffett, what he's been doing is pretty basic. It's not that complicated. Value, quality, a little bit of leverage, et cetera. But the biggest challenge, we say his alpha historically has not been his investment strategy, but it's been rather him sticking with it and not deciding after one, two, five, eight years of underperformance that, oh, hey, I'm going to become a growth guy now, or I'm going to go chase, you know, some other market. And and he currently, like, we, we, we track this through 13 Fs and say, if you just replicated his stock picks, which by the way, an investor could do in like 20 minutes a year. So <laughs> once a quarter, buy his top 10 stock picks, update it once a quarter, you're done. Historically, since 2000, that's outperformed like five percentage points per year. But he's underperformed. It's something like eight that, or sorry, that portfolio is underperformed like eight of the last 10 years versus the S&P. And so we often say, we joke to say, look, if you blinded these results and showed these to uh, CalPERS, uh, not to not to disparage CalPERS, but just an institution and said, hey, look at this manager over the last 10 years and he's underperformed eight of the last 10, you know, no person on the planet would want to allocate to that strategy, despite the fact he would have beaten 98% of all mutual funds over the period. And, and and that goes to your point of how these factors go in and out of favor, but not just factors too. You know, it's countries and sectors. We talked about China, um, but other markets as well. And that, that that's the hardest part. Let's take a quick break from the show to bring you a message from our sponsor. What if you could help combat global climate change and make money at the same time? Introducing Wonder Capital, the award-winning online investment platform that allows individuals to invest in solar energy projects across the U.S. Guys, living here in California, I can tell you there's a lot of support for this type of environmentally conscientious investing. Even outside of California, as I speak around the country, it seems I regularly meet advisors and investors who are interested in ways to combine investing with social responsibility. So here's how these two things come together at Wonder. Your investment goes directly to helping U.S. small and medium-sized businesses install solar panels. Wonder manages the portfolio for you, making the process easy. As those businesses repay their loans to Wonder, you receive monthly payments deposited directly into your bank account. So what kind of return can you make? Well, Wonder's online investment platform allows you to earn up to 8.5% annually. And remember, this is while diversifying your portfolio, curbing pollution, and combating global climate change. And best of all, Wonder Capital doesn't charge investors any fee for managing your money. I checked Wonder's sign-up process and found it to be simple and straightforward. Plus, you can invest with as little as $1,000. Create an account for free at wondercapital.com forward slash meb. That's Wonder with a U. Wonder Capital. Do well and do good. Now back to the show. We, we think a lot about the behavioral ways to try to keep people from being, you know, their own worst enemy. And one of the ideas we'd floated this week was the concept of a, a, a really long-term lockup. And I said, look, w- what about the idea? I said, this is Cinco de Mayo. So I had a little tequila. I said, what about the idea of launching a fund and saying, you know what? This will be ultra low costs. But you gotta you get to choose between a ten to fifty year lockup, and I said that would be a great way to get people to really put their mouth you know money where their mouth is, and and people in general hated the idea, <laughs> and they hated it because they said, well, what if I need to change my strategy, or you know, what if what if the world changes? So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Well, Meb, actually, you brought up a really interesting point. So uh, I met a uh, a private equity guy, a very successful one. Uh, someone challenged him and said, "Hey, have you looked at all these, uh, you know, private equity replication strategy that claims that uh, a, a, a private equity is no no more than a you know small cap exposure levered?" And the private equity guy says, "Well, you know, that's probably true." But the one thing that I can provide my investors at uh, a levered small cap strategy can't is that I can lock up my investor for 10 years so that he can ignore or, in fact, 
uh, he won't see the volatility of that lever portfolio, so he's able to write it and fully capture the premium associated with the strategy. Whereas if the, the investor tried to replicate that himself and levered up a, a, a small cap portfolio, you know, he would have uh, bailed sort of, you know, first, uh, first sign of a uh, shock spike up in, uh, in volatility and never would have been able to, uh, to, to ride the strategy to, uh, to its sort of logical end and capture the, uh, the, re- the, the necessary premium. And I thought that was actually a really, really interesting way to think about the value of lockup in the presence of uh, investor behavior. You know, it, it, it's actually really profound. And I hadn't thought of that same topic until I heard a couple other podcasts. And it was either Patrick O'Shaughnessy or Tim Ferriss, maybe. But but talking about that concept and say, look, I think as Tim said, I'm a terrible public markets investor because I'll muck around and do everything that all the biases you know say you'll do. But the private equity, because I can't sell, I just kind of forget about it, put away in a mental lockbox, and one day, if it either goes bankrupt or public, I'll, I'll have an exit. But the two ideas we floated, I said, Jeff, there's my um, co-host, Jeff, I said, Jeff, we could either do a locked up fund where we charge a penalty that declines over time. So if you pull out in year one, it's 10% penalty, but it declines over time. Or I said, you could charge a 10% sales load up front, put it in the sidecar. And at year 10, that money goes back to the investors, but anyone who had left, uh, you know, their, their load goes in. So the people that stayed not only get their own money back, they get the bonus. Anyway, when, this may be a good grad project for us to, to you know, give all the UCLA students come up with a good structure here. We love brainstorming these ideas because we see it so much every day um, being both a individual account managers as well as ETF manager. You know, the, the, the flows into our funds and strategies, it's almost always the, 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 the worst timing and the worst. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you've seen that as well. And by the way, along the same line, so there's been a lot of, you know, development in the U.S. with these robo-advisors and automated investing solutions. Well, I think you're interesting. I think it's going to be challenging for a lot of them not having, uh, you know, one of the biggest benefits of financial advisor is, you know, that um, wall in between, you know, you touching your own account and selling. And, and I think the automated, while designed fantastically may run into that in a bear market. We'll see. We haven't had one in forever here in the U.S. Is, is there a culture of these automated solutions developing that you've seen in Asia at all? Or is that something that, that is probably a big opportunity that's, that's not really being um, tackled? You know, anything that's, uh, that's had success in the U.S., you'll instantly find uh, a lot of uh, uh, look-alike solutions in Asia as well, and it's no different from uh, for the robo-advisory. So a lot of robo-advisory type uh, technology apps and firms are, are, are starting to flood the market in Asia. It is really interesting to see because I think in the U.S., a lot of the robos are about user experience. Uh, it's trying to take the complexity out of investing. And also, it's trying to take uh, a lot of the, uh, the conflict of interest between advisors and, and clients out of the system uh, by you know, giving you a fairly templated standard advice, very you know, transparent format and a lot of this no more than a diversified portfolio that rebalance regularly uh, and so I really see that as a disruption to the financial advisory uh, ecosystem where you're seeing clients being disappointed with the quality of the advice and with the uh, conflict of interest that's almost embedded in these uh, in these advice provision in China uh, we're seeing some of the same thing uh, but there it's sold much more as uh, artificial intelligence, like super smart computers that will aggressively asset allocate for you, time for you, pick funds for you. I guess uh, it's, it's you know, whether that's ultimately successful, uh, whether they ultimately deliver goods remains to be seen. But uh, yes, you see robo-advisory in Asia, but it's uh, operating under a very different ethos. It's about yeah. artificial intelligence more so than uh, trying to mend the issue of uh, loss of trust between advisors and their clients. It's touching on two of your favorite topics. One, it's <laughs> kind of selling the dream and selling the complexity too. <laughs> yeah. 
the old the old Chinese proverb: fish fish see the bait, but not the hook. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna we're, we're gonna touch on like a couple more questions. We only have you for about 10, 15 more minutes, and we'll we'll try to ask one or two of the Twitter questions that people sent in. One is an interesting area that's not really related. It, it is it's related because you've done some research there, but I, I thought it was really interesting. You know, a lot of firms when you look at their websites, they'll say stuff like you know, here's our qualifications. We manage this many billions of dollars. I'm a CFP and yada, yada. We've been in business 20 years and it's, it's kind of really about them. But I, I thought your values was a really interesting um, commentary and I'll read a couple of them. And then uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about a paper that you, the research you've done there about um, kind of the culture of blame, but a couple of the values said we are deeply opposed to manager ego and all it represents, you know, and nicely on the flip side, you say we are serious about our strategy and clients, but we don't take our tells too seriously. We strive for authenticity and humility when communicating ideas in building relationships. Um, there's a couple others. We're motivated by purpose rather than money. So maybe talk a little bit about that, but, but, but with a nod to kind of your, your research and thoughts into manager selection criteria. And there's a quote at one point you said, should be examined from a higher level of consciousness and responsibility. What do you mean by that? You know, uh, as I've been talking to more institutional clients, we're now doing more ESG and particularly paying attention to the governance part. They really care about the governance of the underlying company we invest in. But many of them don't seem to care very much about the, the governance of the managers that they invest in. That is why we want our, our, you know, our IBMs and our uh, Philip Morris to be more socially responsible we don't seem to ask of the same of our our managers, and this is where I think you know uh, investors have started to, to to turn a little more sour these days about uh, you know the big hedge fund managers sort of swagger and ego and the way it gets expressed in uh, conspicuous consumption, so on and so forth. Again, I don't want to be judgmental about that, but I think there's something to be said about how that attitude of, you know, I deserve my 2 plus 20. You know, I deserve the, the incredibly large compensation package that I paid myself, despite the fact that over in the long horizon, I, I may not outperform the benchmark. I recall the famous bet between Warren Buffett and their protege partners about that one. I, I think that's an area where investors really could spend a little more time thinking about. Are they okay with the values being expressed by the managers and their fee schedule and by the managers and the way in which, you know, they, they seem to feel perfectly justified for the very asymmetric outcome where, you know, regardless of what happens, manager win. And over a long horizon at the fees, clients have actually been not well served by our industry and would have been much better had we all told them to go buy a Vanguard index fund or, or met one of your ETFs. I think this this does warn our industry and all of us practitioners uh, to think about what value have we actually created, and can we really honestly say that we have created value? I was listening to an interesting podcast with, and I'm going to totally blanked on his name. He's the guy that wrote Influence, and then the new book Persuasion. He was talking about the the brilliance in the Warren Buffett letters, and he says. Every Warren Buffett letter you look at, you'll notice he leads with one of his mistakes. And he says that has a way of disarming people, but also it's it's honest and it's genuine and saying, look, we're not perfect. We're not just going to brag about what we do so well, but we're going to say, look, here's something we tripped up at and failed. And he said in some years when Buffett's made no mistakes... He'll go back and say, well, in 1993, I remember this mistake we made. And it's, it's, a, it's a great way, but, but it's, it's, it is a good example of the way that the manager thinks and culture. Um, and, and one of the biggest lessons that almost every investor learns at some point in their career, you know, is humility. And if uh, I think like nothing I see more and more than if you don't have humility, it's you're just kind of asking to get taken uh, to, to the woodshed at some point. But thankfully it happened to me a lot when I was poor and broke and, and didn't have as much money to, to lose when going bankrupt. Um, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's do a couple quick hits before you have to go hop on a plane. Where, where are you heading to, by the way? Heading to Hong Kong. 
cool. Um, I've only been once, but absolutely loved it. I need I need to to head back to Asia um, sooner than later. But I'm going to ask you my a uh, couple Twitter questions. Some we've already covered on factors, and 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 I'm not going to ask you what your best long short idea is because I know you <laughs> tend to be a little more like me, quanti. You can answer that if you want, but someone asked what your best long short idea is. One of the questions was, what's a bit? Have you noticed any difference, or is there any main um, uh, takeaways for? Are emerging markets any different at all than than developed in the U.S. as far as factor investing, or is there things that um, it just happens to be more inefficient? So the question is, what, what what's the main differences with factors for developed and emerging? Uh, so it's absolutely correct to to assume to, to to say that the emerging markets are more inefficient, and so uh, you know by deduction the anomalies and the premium associated with these anomalies are just larger. Uh, but what is also true is that the, uh, the bubble as they form or the deviation away from you know, fair pricing that mean reverts later, they can extend for a much longer period of time. So I do want to remind everyone of the famous Keynes saying that is the market can stay uh, irrational longer than you have capital or conviction to stay in the market so um that's that's advice to everyone who's looking to uh, to you know invest in factors or quant strategies that uh, you have to be even more patient and be able to um to to uh withstand um some meaningful drawdown before you see the the really really breathtaking recovery and, and is, is, is factor investing in general, one of, one of the questions is, is, is it embraced as much as it is in the U.S. in, in Asia, or is it a little bit of a harder sell or education um, hill, or what's, what's thoughts there? Uh, the, the education work is, is uh, definitely uh, monumentous in Asia because um, it is still very much a nascent, immature market. Uh, the sophistication isn't quite there, so the more quantitative and academic language isn't as natural when you, uh, when you, when you speak to, to clients and investors. So there's a lot of education that's required, I think, before people could fully embrace and execute on, on factor investing or smart beta. But I would say the intuition about you know, markets make mistakes, investors make mistakes, and the type of mistakes they make, if you can put it in that uh, language, uh, I think you know, perhaps in many ways, the EM markets are, are more receptive and are natural believers of uh, the fact that there are a lot of investors who make a lot of mistakes. Each year, we have one one theme question. 2016 was a little different. 2017, it is, what has been your most memorable investment? And it can be a good one. It can be a bad one. It can be a trade, whatever. But the first thing that comes to mind when I ask that question and, and one, one you're willing to share. <laughs> Absolutely. Investing in emerging markets the last five years. You know, that's been a big overweight in my personal portfolio. And it's been a big overweight in uh, many of the clients who bought into my strategy of research affiliates. Uh, you know, Rob and I created Rafi and then Rafi's been a big over. Uh, has a big overweight in, in EM uh, because EM became very cheap in the start of the last five years and in fact continued to underperform for much of the last five years. Uh, but very memorable because it was very painful for much of the last five years. And, uh, you know, every conversation we had with clients was, well, you know, the, the yes, there's been some shock to the region. Yes, performance has been bad, but look at how much cheaper it has it has gotten relative to rest of the market, relative to uh, the U.S. And that was a harder and harder conversation to have with clients. And the, the recent recovery, uh, in some ways, felt like a vindication. But I think that the, the big takeaway is um, anytime you choose to be a long-term investor, and I really do believe that's where the advantage is, it's, you know, it's very, very hard. For you as an investor to ride that out, and it's even harder if you're acting as a fiduciary, acting as an advisor, because uh, your clients are naturally going to doubt whether you got it wrong this time. They're naturally going to be more prone to blame you and lose patience with you. And so it's it's a hard, hard job to do right by your client to get them to stay 
on stay invested. Uh, and that's just a lesson I keep uh, relearning over and over again, how hard it is and how important it is to still make sure we do that and do that well. And, and particularly for in, investors, we used to do a chart in a speech when we were talking about global valuations. And the left side of the chart would be the cheapest CAPE ratio of countries, and the right would be the most expensive. And we used to label the left side of the chart career risk. And I said, yep. look, you know, it is the smartest thing for you to, to tilt towards value and away from the expensive side. But if you go by Brazil, Russia, Europe, everything else in between, and you get it wrong, so 2014 or so, you know, some of those years prior, um, you get fired. And if you do well, maybe your clients notice, maybe they bring you a bottle of wine, but, but for the <laughs> most part, they'll forget pretty quick. And this has been the hardest environment to be an international investor because what's happened, the U.S. has gone straight up for eight years and one of the largest outperformances we've ever seen versus the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the foreign markets in general. But that, that since maybe last summer, that seems to be changing or, or uh, changing for the positive. But we'll see. We'll have you back on in a year or five years and see what, <laughs> what the world looks like then. All right. Last question before you go hop on your plane. Um, when you used to talk to your UCLA students or you're talking to, you know, the listeners on this podcast who you know, the, the kind of number one piece of actionable investment advice, and it may be a little repetitive because you've covered a lot of good stuff already. Is there kind of one final takeaway that it, advice to, to, to investors across the board that um, really pops to the, the forefront of your, your mind? Yeah, this is probably the simplest advice, uh, and it's really easy to get, but uh, it's also really hard for people to remember. And it is what I call the the, the first fundamental law of investing, which is Outperformance, called alpha, if you may, uh, is a zero-sum game. Meaning, if you are going to win in the game of investing, if you're going to outperform, someone has to underperform, and that means you have to be trading against people who are less informed, less educated, less skilled than you are. What confidence do any of us have that the trade we place, a bet we make? Uh, satisfy that condition. That is, the guy on the other side is really dumber and less educated. And until you can convince yourself of that, you really ought to stop trading. I think that's great advice. Let's let's quietly end there. That was that was great, Jason. It's been awesome. Uh, have safe travels. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time out today. Uh, thank you, man. It's been fun. Well, well, we'll look forward to connecting again one day is when I'm in Asia. We'll have to do a, a live recording. Listeners, thanks for taking the time out to uh, tune in today. We always welcome feedback and questions for the mailbag at feedback at the com. As a reminder, you can always find the show notes. Uh, we'll link to all Jason's writings, research, new website, Twitter, even though he doesn't tweet anymore, and other episodes at mebfaber.com forward slash podcasts. Uh, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. This podcast is sponsored by the Soothe app. We all know how stressful investing in volatile markets can be. That's why I use Soothe. Soothe delivers five-star certified massage therapists to your home, office, or hotel in as little as an hour. They bring everything you need for a relaxing spa experience without the hassle of traveling to a spa. Podcast listeners can enjoy 30 bucks to their first Soothe massage with the promo code MEB. Just download the Soothe app and insert the code before booking. Happy relaxation.